Hey guys, it's Allie. Welcome back to Infertile AF the podcast. This is episode 227 called Sasha Hackman. This podcast is sponsored by Receptiva DX. Receptiva DX is a powerful test that has helped thousands of women who have experienced recurrent pregnancy loss or IVF failure. The test helps detect inflammatory conditions of the uterus that might be preventing you from becoming pregnant or staying pregnant. The most common underlying condition of a positive Receptiva DX test is endometriosis with or without symptoms. If you or someone you know has struggled with IVF, Receptiva DX may give you the answer and treatment protocols that you're looking for. Talk with your doctor about Receptiva DX because the journey is so worth it. Plus, guys, Infertile AF listeners are getting $75 off the Receptiva DX test. So all you have to do is go to ReceptivaDX.com or download the app Receptiva DX, use code InfertileAF23, and you'll get $75 off. Thanks, Receptiva DX. Okay, you guys, I have such an amazing guest today. Her name is Sasha Hackman, MD. She's a fertility doctor. She's a friend of mine. I've known her for the past three years at least. We met on social media and she's done so much stuff with Fertility Rally. She spoke at Fertility Rally Live. She's done some virtual events with us. She's just been a big friend and supporter of the rally and vice versa. She tells it like it is. She's so smart. I mean, she does her research. So definitely follow her if you're not already at Sasha Hackman, MD. It's S-A-S-H-A-H-A-K-M-A-N-M-D. I'll put it in the show notes as well. But when she first started, when I first met her, she was Sasha Fierce. Dr. Sasha Fierce was her handle. So she's changed it since then. You'll hear why. But when we're talking about that, Dr. Fierce, you'll know what we're referring to. That's how Blair and I met her. And we're like, oh my God, we love her so much. And she's just super cool. She is beautiful inside and out. And she is going to tell us her fertility story today. So we're going to talk about all of it. We're going to talk about a lot about why female physicians have a greater percentage of infertility, which I always find so fascinating. And she's going to talk about her you know, path to parenthood. She does have a little guy now who we'll talk about, but we're going to get into how she met her husband, what was going on with them, you know, how she was kind of reckless with her meds once she got going, how she took some matters into her own hands. And we're also going to talk about hot button issue, which is exercise and fertility. So we're going to get into all that and her thoughts on that. So she works out a lot. She is a fitness expert, in my opinion, you'll see on her Instagram, but she has a lot of interesting things to say about whether or not you should exercise during treatment and TTC and all that. So, so much going on. I just adore her in case you couldn't tell from my emphatic intro, but without further ado, this is Sasha's infertility story. Hi, Sasha. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I'm so excited to talk to you in depth today. Talked to you a bunch of times before for various things, and you've always been so wonderful and brilliant and spreading Thank such you. great information. But today we're going to talk about your story. So let's start at this the beginning. This is a first for me. Is this it? This is a first for me. Yeah. Oh, it cool. Is. I'm so honored. Thank you for doing this. Of course. So tell me, did you always want to be a mom? Yes. Okay. For as long as I can remember. I mean, it, it was always like, that's one of the greatest goals in life. I had a lot of aspirations in life, but this was definitely a big one. Big one. Okay. So as everybody knows who probably follows you, you know, you're a board certified OBGYN. You are a board eligible REI, medical advisor at Baby Center. I'm looking at your Instagram. That's where I'm reading this from right now. <laughs> Fertility doctor. <laughs> Do you still go by Dr. Fierce? <laughs> it's been a while. Oh my God. I feel like I have abandoned that name, even though it's my favorite handle. It was this whole pressure of like, you know, be professional, put your name out there. There are some people that don't even know your name and how are they going to 
blind you as their doctor. Right. And so I retired it, but I miss it. It was a great handle. I, I remember when Blair and I first found you and like reached out to you to do something with Fertility Rally. And we're like, she's such a badass, Dr. Fierce. Like she lives up to her name. So you'll oh always God, be that. You in my, you'll always be Aww. that in my book. But anyway, so obviously, you know, you have this medical career, which is huge. Tell me about that. And, you know, when you decided that you wanted to go into this field and be a doctor in the back of your mind, did that affect when and how and where you were going to have kids? So I guess I never really thought about that. I saw so many women in medicine who would do both at the same time. And although it looked exhausting, it also looked super rewarding. And when I went into medicine, I just figured, you know, I'm going to meet my person and I'm going to get married and I'm going to have kids relatively young and it's going to be hard, but it's going to be amazing. And what I didn't realize that in, in my situation, at least the dating scene was actually quite difficult as a woman pursuing a medical career. So going through med school and traveling for rotations and then doing residency And for those who don't know, an OBGYN residency is four years long. And like I would work 14 hour days every day. And on the weekends, I'd do 24 to 28 hour shifts. That's not including my two months of doing night shift where you work six nights out of the seven days a week, every week for a month, Mm -hmm. sorry, two months, two months out of the year. And it would be like from 5 p.m. to 7 a.m. at best. And so you had very little personal time to go out and meet people. Right. And what that translated into is like, okay, I've been single for so long. Like I would go on dates and meet guys, but it never worked out. One of the greatest problems was that a lot of these guys would just be like, you don't have any time for me. And this is ridiculous. Like just call in sick. And I'm like, there, there's no such thing. You can't do that. God. <laughs> and so... All of a sudden, I'm sitting here like, oh my God, I'm I'm 30 years old. I am not even in a serious relationship. I want kids and I still want to do fellowship, which is another three years of training um, after becoming an OBGYN. So what on earth is going to happen? So it caused a lot of stress for me. I'm not going to lie because I refused to settle. I didn't want to just be married to be married so that I could have kids. I wanted to find my person, my best friend, my partner for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And especially someone that I could actually see myself parenting with. Mm -hmm. So that's where, you know, knowing that I wanted to go into REI, should I get accepted that, you know, if I didn't meet someone that year, then that was it. That was my deadline for freezing my eggs. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So then when did you meet Eric and how? So when I made that decision of finally going to make that consultation, the appointment so that I could freeze my eggs that month, I happened to meet Eric. And I really did not think that this was going anywhere. I was like, Mm -hmm. well, I'm moving to Georgia in eight months. I had just gotten accepted into fellowship. Mm -hmm. And REI fellowship is actually extremely competitive. And very difficult to get into because there's usually around only um, 40 to 50 spots in the whole country. Wow. Yes. So I did not know that. Yeah. It's like the cream of the crop applicants. Everyone applying has these crazy resumes. Everyone is absolutely incredible. And so it's kind of a crapshoot as to whether you're going to be accepted in a position or not. Mm-hmm. And so I had just gotten into fellowship, which was That's so incredible. Exciting. I didn't, I mean, I had no idea it was so competitive. I mean, I already knew you were a badass, but that makes it even a hundred times more. Like, that's so great. Yeah, it was amazing. And uh, and that's why I would say like most REIs are, are really impressive, at, especially like the newer generation. They had to work so, so, so hard in order to get into that fellowship because spots are so limited. But yeah, it it was it was tough. And I met Eric. We just kind of casually dated. I really did not think it was going anywhere, but I was really just into him. And and I told him it was the first time I had the guts to do this in kind of a very new I, I don't even know that I would have called it a relationship at that point, but I said, Listen, I want a family. I want kids. I want to get married. I'm really into you. 
like, if this is just for fun for you, let's just call it off. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, no hard feelings, but this is your exit point if you're not down to make this a serious thing. Right. You're like, and I'm so, giving you an out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and surprisingly, he was kind of like, okay, all right, let's 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 try to see where this goes and, and really make this serious. Had you guys talked about like having kids and building a family? Totally. And, you know, one of the biggest things we had to figure out is that, you know, I'm born and raised Christian and he's Jewish. And so for him, it was like, you know, usually it's the mom's religion that gets passed down. And so we had to really talk logistics about because both of our religions and cultures mean a lot to us. And I Mm -hmm. said, listen, um, I completely respect your beliefs and your culture. And I think that in my opinion, we can integrate both. And so we really spoke at length about how we would do that. Should we have kids? Should we get married? How it would look like for our family? And once we kind of figured that part out, then it was like we were both all in. Mm -hmm. We knew that this was it. Okay. So then once you, I'm fast forwarding a whole bunch. When did you guys start to try? Like when were you like, okay, let's do this. So we started to try as soon as I graduated fellowship. Um, And the reason for that, I would have started a lot sooner, but we were apart for three years. And even though I was kind of like, well, you know, I'm ready to start trying and get pregnant now. He really didn't want to be away and apart for any part of it. He's like, I just want to be at every ultrasound, every milestone. I want to be there and I don't want to miss out. Right. So we agreed that we would wait until I was back in Michigan. We were in the same city living together as Mm -hmm. most couples do. And then we would start trying. But because I have PCOS, I knew that like for me, starting to try would mean immediate ovulation induction. And so before I even, before we even started trying and before we knew we were going to start trying, I had already done my own complete fertility evaluation. I had one of my colleagues do my saline ultrasounds and do all the blood work and everything um, that I I do for my patients because why would I not want to know all the information that I can have before starting to try? And, you know, of course that entailed me early morning one day before going into work being like, here's a cup, hurry up, give me a sample. Right. <laughs> he's just, he's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and and then You're I like, don't I ask questions, <laughs> just do it. <laughs> I'm bringing a sample into work and I look under the microscope and I'm like, all right, we're good. <laughs> you looked at the sample. That's so cool. Oh, I sure did. I, I did it with the andrologist and it was, it was a good time. <laughs> oh my God. I have not it. interviewed anyone yet who can say that they've done that. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> That's amazing. Did you end up freezing your eggs when you had been thinking about it before you met Eric or no? So I didn't freeze eggs. We actually ended up freezing embryos. I did the thing that I always recommend not to do, which is, you know, at that point we, well, okay. So let's backtrack a little bit. Okay. So I wanted to freeze my eggs, but at this point, what people didn't know is that we actually secretly went off and legally got married. Oh, wow. (laughs) This was a couple of years before our romantic. um, I love it. It was a couple of years before actual wedding. Mm -hmm. And so at that point I was like, listen, we're married. Why would I just freeze my eggs? I know that we're not going to transfer embryos at this point in time, but let's make embryos so that we have all the data. And I told him, I said, you know, it's funny. I always tell my patients like, never do this. At least take half of those eggs and freeze them unfertilized because that way you can decide the disposition of those eggs. But I, you know, just felt so sure of this that we decided to make embryos and freeze them just in case we ever needed them. Okay. And it was my way of preserving fertility. And I still tell patients, like, even if you have a committed partner, it's a good idea to still freeze your eggs because you just never know. Right. Like Um, if it doesn't work out with that partner. Exactly. Then you might be older and now you're dealing with a situation of possible infertility and inability to reverse the clock. Like that's it. Whatever Mm -hmm. you're left with is what you're left with and you can't go back in time. And I would say that's the number one biggest regret that I have in my older patients who come for treatment 
especially once they hit 40, it's kind of like, oh my God, I wish I froze my eggs when I was younger. I may not even be in this situation. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the time I was 32. So I was like, you know, if God forbid anything ever happened, I still have a few years of being able to just like freeze eggs and then, you know, have that as a backup. Right. But yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. At that point. Yeah. And then when did you find out that you had PCOS? So this was, um, I would say probably towards the end of my residency. So when I was younger, I would go like maybe eight months without a period. And Mm -hmm. then I would bleed for two months at a time. And it was very erratic, very unpredictable, Mm -hmm. um, terrible, terrible cystic acne. Like it was all, I'm surprised I don't have worse scarring. It was really bad. Um, I never dealt with the hirsutism thing, but I was on birth control pills for I think 15 years to just try to control these symptoms. But the doctor that put me on the pill at the time never really did a proper evaluation, which, you know, with my career now, I know is a big no, no, like Mm -hmm. you got to do the work up first before you start the treatment. You can't just treat something without knowing what's going on. Fast forward to my residency. I stopped birth control pills because I just wanted to see if I now bleed at regular intervals. And once again, I just would go months without a period. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it would just be super irregular. And that's when I decided to do the workup with one of my attendings. And it was pretty clear at that point that I had PCOS, which was never, it it was just missed for so long. And I felt Mm -hmm. really silly as an OBGYN, not knowing that I had this the whole time and it just was kind of missed. Mm -hmm. So interesting. So I was reading one of your recent posts on Instagram and, you know, talking about how twice as many female physicians suffer from infertility than the general population. So can we talk about that a little bit? What do you know about that? And what's, what do they attribute that to? So I think it's attributed to a couple things because the biggest thing that we've noticed is that the, that female surgeons are the most affected by far. And I always wonder if it's something like electrocautery, you're inhaling kind of the fumes from the desiccated tissue. Oh, wow. I don't know. We don't fully understand or know. I'm sure a big part of it too is the lifestyle. In a surgical residency, and that includes an OBGYN residency, you are so sleep deprived. You're working so hard. There's no doubt you have elevated cortisol levels extreme stress. And so I'm sure that is a big contributing factor. Um, And this is just speculation, of course, like there hasn't been any study that says, okay, we've really looked into this. And we know for certain that these are the reasons why female physicians have a greater percentage of infertility, but I'm sure that those are contributing factors. Mm -hmm. Okay. So interesting. It's such a like, I've, and yeah. I've, you know, talked to so many doctors in this field. Like I know your friends with Ruhi and, you know, yeah. countless others who have talked about that in their own fertility journeys as well. So it's just, it's really, I find it really, really fascinating. Yeah. It's, um, it's fascinating. And it's also really sad because like yeah. we work so hard to help other people. And then, you know, a lot of programs too, they do not cover any sort of fertility treatment. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, as a fertility specialist, I have the perks of my job, right? And so most of us have easy ways of getting treated without necessarily paying the full price of it, having, you know, our jobs covering our treatments if needed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'd say a lot of physicians don't necessarily have that luxury. And, And especially if you're in training, you get paid very, very little. Mm -hmm. And so most doctors who are in residency or fellowship can't afford it if they don't have coverage from their programs. And then they find themselves trying to really catch up as soon as they graduate and start getting that proper physician paycheck. And, uh, And now they have the resources, but they've lost many good years of some young, healthy eggs. Right. And then you were talking about too, how they don't have the flexibility to go through the treatments and go in for all the appointments and all that stuff. So exactly. Kind of messed up. Yeah. It's, it really depends on the support from your program. There are some programs where like the program director, if you're in training can be super, super supportive. And I've seen some residents and fellows who they're like, 
My program director said, whatever I need, they will manage to cover it for me, which I love hearing. And then others are kind of like, I don't know how I'm going to make this work. I probably have to take like a week of vacation or something to try to work this out. Or me like going in super, super early in the morning to do the scan myself just to accommodate because I know that they have to. And, and, you know, most of us will do whatever it takes to accommodate these, these women because we know that like, you know, you're, you're serving other people and you're not being helped out here. So we got to do what we can to, mm-hmm. to help you. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Okay. So let's go back to your story and the chronology of everything that happened. So with the PCOS, you said that you needed to do, did you say forced ovulation? Yeah. So basically okay. I took, let, I took letrozole, letrozole. and okay. um, I responded pretty well to it, which was great. Of course, I was monitoring my ovulation through ultrasound and blood work because, you know, it's like at my fingertips at work, which, which was great. And after six months of ovulation induction and even some IUIs, still no pregnancy, there was one cycle where, oh my God, Eric got really annoyed with me for doing this, but I didn't tell him I totally super ovulated. Um, and I actually had three dominant follicles, which I would normally actually cancel patients for this. Um, but at that point it had been, I think five months and I was like, I, I am doing this so perfectly in terms of timing. How on earth am I still not pregnant? What is going on here? <laughs> yeah. So I was like, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to trigger. It's going to be three eggs. If there's triplets, I'm okay with reducing Okay. whatever it takes. I just want to be pregnant. You know, mm-hmm. I, I definitely don't, I didn't even want twins. Like I would not be okay being pregnant with twins. Mm-hmm. So if I had to do selective reduction, which I know a lot of people feel some type of way about that, but I feel strongly about, you know, it's, it's to each their own. And 100%, it would have been I a agree. very, yeah, it would have been a difficult thing to go through, but I overall would have been just happy that I was pregnant. And, you know, of course I didn't get pregnant. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I'm like, man, I released three eggs and, you know, we did IUI and that was an incredible sample and still nothing. And so at that point, um, you know, statistically speaking, after six months without treatment, 80% of couples will have conceived. Mm. And so, and that's without treatment. With Mm -hmm. treatment, it should be a little, you know, it's harder to say because, we're specifically the data looks at the infertile population. Nobody's treating fertile couples to see how quickly mm-hmm. they're going to get pregnant in six mm-hmm. months. But we know that with natural conception, 80% of couples. So I said, you know, if 80% of couples will have conceived by now naturally, and we have embryos, I think it's time to just not sit around and wait. I'm 35 years old. Let's just do this thing and transfer an embryo. Mm-hmm. This episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-proportioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. You can skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. And that's why it's America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh does more than just delicious dinners. Not only can you take your pick from 40 weekly recipes, but you can choose from over 100 items to round out your order from snacks and easy lunches to desserts and pantry necessities. Everything arrives in one box on a delivery day that you choose. No worries, guys. If you're not a pro in the kitchen, HelloFresh's foolproof recipes arrive pre-portioned and easy to prepare in just a few easy steps. I have personally tried and loved HelloFresh. It saves time. It makes cooking so easy and fast. And everything I've tried from HelloFresh is super delicious. So here's the thing. Go to HelloFresh.com slash InfertileAF16 and use code InfertileAF16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. I mean, I don't know if it gets any better than that. Again, you can go to HelloFresh.com slash InfertileAF16 and use code InfertileAF16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. I know everybody listening is looking for fresh, easy, healthy meals. 
So guys, please check out HelloFresh and make sure that you check out America's number one meal kit. And now a brief word from one of our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Avi. Avi is the obvious choice in health and wellness supplements. Their products range from collagen for your hair, skin, and nails to weight loss solutions, to immune support, to hormone balance. Avi has more than 400,000 customers worldwide and has a Facebook community with over 65,000 active members. So guys, I got a box full of Avi products recently and I added them to my daily routine. One of their products that I want to talk about today is called Goodbye and it's my new fave. So here's why. Avi's Goodbye is the perfect solution to hormonal balance issues, which include weight gain, hormonal acne, hot flashes, and so much more. Goodbye contains key ingredients such as DIM to help regulate estrogen production and KSM66 ashwagandha to help you feel relaxed and stress-free. And I must say that since adding Avi to my daily routine, I've had more energy and a clearer mind. So guess what, everybody? I think you guys can probably guess. You've probably heard enough of these podcast episodes to know that Infertile AF listeners can get 25% off today with code InfertileAF at myavi.com. That's myobvi.com. Use promo code InfertileAF and you'll get 25% off today. It's super Avi why you should do it. See what I did there? Uh, let Avi help you reach your goals this summer. Again, go to myavi.com and use code InfertileAF for 25% off. Thanks, Avi. And had you tested the embryos? So we had not tested them because I was 32. And what we do know is that PGT has not been shown to improve pregnancy rates at all for women under 35, arguably even under 38. Uh, um, I've never, you're it, like the it, stat expert. You've got all these, like, well, I didn't know that. It helps that I just took my boards too. You know, they say right. like, when you take your boards, it's the smartest you're ever going to be. So. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all fresh um, front of mind. It's all, it's all fresh, but yeah. we, we know that, you know, if, if you think about a single IVF cycle, say you have five embryos, if you transfer all five, one after the other, the pregnancy rate, rather, regardless of whether you did PGT is going to be the same, right? The purpose of PGT is kind of to reduce that time to pregnancy. And so now whether it does reduce that time is super controversial for younger women. But when you look at women who are 38 plus, PGT certainly helps to reduce the time to having a baby. And so, and and that's how I counsel my patients too when we talk about it. I'm like, you know, especially if you're under 35, there's truthfully no real benefit to doing PGT unless you've had failed IVF cycles in the past. So this is your first cycle save your money unless you're trying to select for gender or something specific, um, then just don't do it. I love that. Hot tip. Yeah. So I was like, why am I going to spend, you know, six, $7,000 to do PGT when it's really not going to make a difference since I'm doing this at 32 and I'm doing it, I'm doing it electively essentially. And I was still, I still held on to hope that like, we're going to get married and then we're, and and even though I know better, I know better. And I still had this hope, like we're going to get married. We're just going to start trying and then boom, it's going to happen. <laughs> and, right. I think um, everybody has that in the back of their minds, right? Like I'll be that exactly. one couple that everybody talks about where, yeah. Yeah. But what I will say is that having frozen embryos made the process way less stressful because it was kind of like, all right, well, this didn't work. Now let's go ahead and transfer an embryo. And, you know, obviously the doctor in me is also just very, okay, next step, troubleshoot, next step, troubleshoot, next step, let's do this. And I just rationalize everything and intellectualize it all. So it was a lot less of an emotional process for me compared to just like, I was treating myself as just another patient that is going through the process. And it honestly made it so much easier. Uh Uh-huh. So how many embryos did you have frozen? Did you say that before? So no. So we had seven frozen embryos, which is quite a lot. That's amazing. It's amazing. And I'm so lucky because what happened was I had about 
50 dominant follicles, which was wild. Five zero. I was, I did not feel good. And and truthfully, the Ari who was doing my cycle, he kept telling me like, reduce your dose, you know better, reduce your dose. And I was very reckless where I, I was kind of like, I want this to be a one and done situation. I upped my dose. Oh my God, whoever's listening to this, please don't ever do that. It is a bad idea. Just don't do it. And, and you really don't get anything extra out of doing that because uh-huh. I had so many follicles. He was able to retrieve uh, I think 24, 26, I can't remember at this point exactly how many, which is still an amazing number. But he was kind of like, I tried to flush all the rest of the follicles and I couldn't get the egg out of uh, out of the other ones, probably because they were not mature. And out of the 24, 26 eggs, there was 11 mature. So very few mature eggs out of the total number. So I knew at that point, I, there was some sort of maturity issue here mm-hmm. with my eggs. I'm, it doesn't matter how big of a dose I took of my meds. I, and so that's, and that's kind of the moral of the story is like, if you go up on your medication dose, you're not necessarily ending up with a higher number. Um, that, that final number is really what counts. And so some people will have a ton of eggs, but not many that get fertilized. I was lucky in the sense that you know, of the 11 mature eggs, we got seven blasts, which is very unusual because typically you see there's a 70% fertilization rate. So say you had 10 eggs, you can expect seven fertilized. And out of the seven, about 50% will make it to a blastocyst stage. So you expect maybe three, maybe four, right? Mm. And so to have seven out of 11 was kind of wild. I did not expect that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Tell me about the first transfer or the transfer. Yeah. So the transfer at this point, the doctor that I was seeing was no longer at that practice. So I was pretty bummed about that. Um, And truthfully, so I'm Canadian and we get one funded cycle. And I, I don't know if you know, Dr. Rahi Victory, but he was, he's I don't. in Canada. Okay. He, he's in Canada. I love that name he's, though. <laughs> I know. I know. Dr. Victory. Like called, who doesn't want to go to that I, doctor? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, he's, he's fantastic. I really love the guy. Almost and, as good as Dr. Um, Fierce, but not quite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a great name. It's a great name. Yeah. Yeah. So he was no longer there, uh, but the embryos were there and I looked into shipping it to him and it it just kind of turned into this whole logistic thing. And I was like, it's, it's fine. I'm just going to kind of control my own protocol and then show up for the transfer. So that's kind of what I did. And when I got there, I asked to go into the lab and see the embryo. I asked to see my chart and to pick the embryo to transfer based on, you know, the grading, the morphology, all of that. And so, yeah, I, luckily got a lot of say in how yes. that all went down. So you were kind of like your own doctor. You're treating yourself basically, so right? Pretty much. That's yeah, so cool. Short, short of doing the actual transfer myself, which I physically cannot do. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I really, really took over my own care to That's be honest. So cool. with you. I mean, I and... feel like if anybody could though, it would be you. <laughs> like, like <laughs> the first one who does their own transfer. <laughs> Oh my God, that would be wild. If I could, I I really would. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So how did, tell me how it went. So thankfully it went great. Um, You know, the transfer was seamless. Like my lining responded fantastic. You know, I called the clinic to say, hey, I'm ready. Things are looking good. I want to start progesterone today so that I could have my transfer in five days. And they were just kind of like, okay. So then I traveled to go get the transfer. And then, um, you know, they're like, well, okay, in two weeks, we're, we're going to have you check to see if you're pregnant. And in my head, I'm like, oh, come on, guys. Do you think I'm waiting two weeks? Yeah, for this? Like, have you met me? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, four days later, I asked our phlebotomist to draw my blood and send out for a beta. And everyone's just kind of like, it's only been four days. What's wrong with you? I'm like, yeah, I'm just kind of curious to see what's going on here. And after four days, I saw that it was seven. And I was like, oh my God, implantation happened. Let's see if this is actually going to keep going. 
Um, and so I kept following my beta levels every two, every 48 hours. And then I went on a little trip for a week. It was supposed to be our like, you know, two week wait trip. And at that point, I already knew that I was pregnant, you know, very, very early, but, you know, pregnant on yes. this trip, which made it so much more relaxing, even though I knew at that point, you know, it could be a biochemical, things might not progress and that's mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Like, at least I know that implantation happened and that's mm -hmm. what I just kept trying to tell myself. And, you know, sometimes it's a double-edged sword having all of this knowledge where you know so much that you can help yourself, but you also know so much that you start to get into your own head and think of every possible outcome that can occur. And those are the moments where you're kind of like, well, ignorance is bliss. It would be nice to know less. And then, um, you know, I come back from this trip and I check my beta and now it's like in a range where it's high enough to detect on ultrasound. So I, you know, tell the sonographer that I was working with at the time, uh, I'm like, all right, Claire, you're going to scan me today. She's like, what already? I'm like, yeah, we're checking for a sac. <laughs> and so things just seemed so easy. And I, I just couldn't believe how fortunate I was. And then um, a couple weeks into it, that's when I started, you know, I was in between patients and I started to have this really heavy bleeding and my heart just sank. I was like, oh my God, I'm miscarrying. This sucks. I can't believe it. I knew it was too good to be true. And you just start to tell yourself all these things. And I'm for in that moment, I just assumed that it was a loss. And I'm just like hysterically crying in the bathroom. And, and then I come out of the bathroom and I call the sonographer. She was like at the um, front desk talking to a patient and I tell her to come immediately. And, you know, she quickly scans me. And to my surprise, there's a heartbeat. And I like, I called Eric and I said, you need to come in right now. Like, oh my God, th this, is, this is so bad. Like I'm bleeding so much. I can't believe it. Yeah. And, um, you know, you're just like totally panic ridden. And I see that it's a subchorionic hematoma and I'm like, okay, thank God there's still a heartbeat. But then you're just kind of on edge for that whole first trimester thinking like, totally, is this going to keep going? Am I right. going to lose this pregnancy? And of course, once again, I'm intellectualizing everything. I'm like, it's probably just chromosomally abnormal. And this is why it's going to end in a miscarriage. And that's okay. This happens. It happens to a lot of women. Mm -hmm. There's a huge percentage of women who deal with this and it sucks, but this is life and I will move on. And so, of course, I, this is what's happening in my brain. <laughs> yeah. We're getting a look um, inside your brain right now. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, I feel very fortunate that everything, when it worked out and, you know, we ended up with Remy. Oh my gosh, the world's cutest baby. We were, I was telling you before we hit record, he, Remy is, so Remy's six months old now. Six months old now. He is gorgeous baby. Just such a little Thank like you. smiley, like looking at, it just like makes your heart like swell, like looking at him. I can't even oh, imagine how you feel you as so his mom. Oh yeah. Oh my so, God. So question about subchorionic hematoma. Is that who you say it? Yes. I can never yeah. get that right. It's like, say that 10 times fast, right? SCH, can I just call it that? Yeah. Are those totally. more common in like IVF pregnancies or is that a myth? Yeah, no, they they are. So it it depends kind of who you talk to. There are some docs who will say, no, they're not. It's pretty much the same across the board. There are some studies though that show a higher association of SCH with IVF pregnancies, particularly when you do, and in some studies that I've read, when you do like a programmed FET cycle. So that means that you're taking estro some form of estrogen and then to build the lining. And then once that lining is nice and that beautiful trilaminar pattern and thick enough, you start progesterone. These cycles compared to what we call a natural frozen embryo transfer cycle, they tend to have a little bit higher rates of complications. I know some practices that and this is more of a luxury of large practices with lots of doctors and lots of staff where they tend to be open seven days a week, even through the holidays. Those are the practices where they tend to do a lot more natural embryo transfer cycles. 
And the beauty of a natural embryo transfer is that there are lower complication rates with that. And then you also get to bypass the progesterone shots, which is a huge, huge plus. But, you know, there is possibly, you know, higher cancellation because if you ovulate too soon or you lose track of when you ovulate, then it has to be canceled and then rescheduled because you want to know that you want to know the exact timing of when progesterone exposure happened so that you could perfectly time when the embryo transfer takes place. Okay. Got it. Wow. So interesting. It's funny because I I love research and at the moment I'm just like jotting all of my research ideas so that if I, you know, with, with the next job, you know, there seems to be a lot of support for research. And so I do think that it's such an important part of our job in this field to contribute to research because we have so much to learn, so much that's still poorly understood and that a lot of it stems from, you know, lack of funding for research, or there are some questions that we just can't answer because it's not ethical to experiment on certain things. You know, you're not going to necessarily sabotage someone's cycle in order to help answer a question, depending on what the research question is. So when it comes to trying to conceive and pregnancy in general, a lot of things are a lot harder to research because we don't want to necessarily have a group of women, which may be the experimental group or the control group, where we're, you know, withholding the standard of care and possible uh, successful outcomes for them. Mm -hmm. So what about if you, I know that you talk a lot about exercising and all that stuff while TTC. Can you give us kind of the Cliff's notes on like for somebody that maybe hasn't seen your fertility rally talk on this or, you know, hasn't watched your Instagram a lot about it? Like people are always saying, is it okay to work out? Is it okay to do X, Y, and Z? Can you give us your just brief thoughts on that? Yes. So um, it actually blows my mind how much I hear about doctors saying not to exercise while you're going through the whole TTC journey while you're going through your treatments and even after you've had an embryo transfer, there is absolutely no data to suggest that exercise harms your success when you're going through fertility treatment or just your simple TTC journey. But lack of exercise can certainly harm, like you need to be active. Now, the, the, the major thing to know about this is A, you you shouldn't just start some really crazy intense exercise routine when you were previously sedentary. So everything in moderation, right? You're not going to go from never having worked out to like deadlifting 200 pounds and breaking your back or right. running a marathon. <laughs> right. You know, everything's got to be gradual and you kind of make your way up and get yourself a sort of condition to whatever type of exercise you're wanting to do. Now, you know, even those who are conditioned, if you are exercising for hours a day, that certainly can impact your reproductive performance. And so cutting back can certainly help, especially if you have a BMI under 19. So extremes of BMI can certainly um, negatively impact your reproduction, but everyone regardless, should do some sort of movement. The recommendation is actually, and if you look at the CDC or the NIH, they there's the recommendation of 150 minutes per week with combination of resistance training and cardio. And that's what I tell my patients is a really good starting point. You can kind of divide it up however you want, whatever works with your schedule, and do the workouts that make you happy and that's sustainable. If you are starting to work out from not working out in your TTC journey, then the general rule of thumb is if you can hold up a conversation throughout your workout, then you are totally fine. Um, There is nothing to worry about there. If you are like over, over exerting yourself, then that may not be great for the average person. Once again, it's not applicable to everybody. But yeah, I mean... Who's expecting anyone to hold off on exercise through the TTC journey when for some women, this could be years. So you're going to tell someone that they should hold off on exercise for years. 
that doesn't even make sense to me. Yeah. Um, Plus, especially when there's no data to show that it harms. Yeah. Thank you for clearing that up. Yeah. Plus for me, it was like, that was my therapy. That was, Correct. you know, soul cycle and yoga were like the two things yes. that got me through and kept me sane, you know, so to yes. not be able to do that would have been really brutal for me. Totally. And I, honestly, I always tell my patients, I'm like, whatever your workout routine is, keep it going. Don't change it. The exception to that, I think I've only ever had one patient with this where she was, she had very, very, very low body fat. And so I told her, I said, like, you need a little bit higher body fat percentage. I mean, you're just, you're super cut and lean. And that's incredible from an athletic performance standpoint. But right now you just need a little bit more fat. So let's like at least up the calories or decrease the exercise. Um, but for the, for the average person, <laughs> honestly, like whatever most people are doing is most likely perfectly fine yeah. and, and should be encouraged to continue it. I was just giggling because I'm like, literally no one has ever said that to me in my entire <laughs> life. Like you just need a little more fat. You need a little more calories. <laughs> never heard that. I've never gotten that. Anyway, yeah. before we wrap, Sasha, tell me um, if, if anybody's listening who might be in like a really low place right now, you know, a lot of our listeners are obviously in the thick of it and looking for support. Yes. What kind of words of wisdom would you impart? I would say that because this is so difficult and everyone's journey is so different, some have it a lot harder than others. Try to find the things in life that brought you joy before you started this journey and keep it going. Don't put your life on hold while you do have to unfortunately make some scheduling sacrifices to go through the treatments. Don't forget to prioritize yourself and to pri to prioritize your partner and remember why you chose each other and remember the things that have made you happy before you embarked on this TTC journey. It's, it's easy to forget about the things that have brought you joy, but bring it back because hopefully one day you're going to have your turn to celebrate your win and you just don't want to put life on hold for too long though, either. All right, friends. Thank you so much for listening. Definitely check her out on IG at Sasha Hackman, MD. Sasha, you are just a bright light and a brilliant voice. So, you know, her Instagram is a mix of, you know, her own stuff, but also lots of facts debunking myths, lots of statistics. As she said, she loves research. So there's just some really good info in there. So no matter where you're at in your journey, give her a follow, pass her along to other people who might be new to this world because they can learn a lot. Also have to give my fertility rally fam some love. So definitely check us out if you're looking for a safe space to land. If you're looking for a community to join, we have so many support groups. We're adding more more and more and more. So, you know, they're all virtual. You can come and share what's going on no matter where you're at. Check us out on Instagram at Fertility Rally. Check us out online at fertilityrally.com. We are open now so you can join for an annual membership. You can join us for a monthly membership and there's lots of options. So you can always reach out to me if you have any questions and definitely follow me on Instagram as well at infertile AF stories. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for helping me surpass the 1 million downloads mark a couple weeks ago, which is really exciting. So I love that you guys continue to pass the show along and send me messages. And I'm so glad it's helping you guys. So thank you. I will talk to you next time. Sending big love.